So, are you interested in exploring the exotic taste of historic cuisine? Then watch on as we delve into a recipe from the 14th and 15th centuries. Medievals ate massive joints of meat straight off of the bone while wiping their faces on sleeves and tablecloth and tossing bones on the floor. Just like Hollywood history class has taught us, right? Mm, yeah, not so much. By contrast to this charming set of imagery, Medieval cuisine was immensely varied, complex, and sophisticated, accompanied by a detailed set of rules of table etiquette, including which fingers to use with which types of food, rules for washing hands before, between, and after eating, and in some cases, quasi-religious rituals of service intended to recall the Last Supper and other church ceremonies that were kind of an integral aspect of medieval life. So, Dishes across Europe in the Middle Ages and Renaissance consisted of exotic flavor combinations and intense spices from the East, with sweet, sour, and savory all combined into one amazing dish. So let us explore one original medieval recipe and attempt to recreate it using my ill-equipped, modern, yet so dated kitchen. The dish we are exploring today is called Alois de Mun. It hails from a collection of recipes ascribed to the head cook of King Richard II. A very sad story about how his life ended. Anyway, it's referred to in the oldest manuscript copy as a form of curry. Now note, not that kind of curry. Note the medieval word curry has nothing to do with Indian curry. The medieval English word, the Middle English word, is a corruption of the Middle French cuire to cook. In other words, the title really means the manner of cooking. This recipe comes from the Harleian Manuscript 4016, which is supposedly housed in the British Library, but I've been unable to find a record of it actually being there or even a digital version of the original manuscript. If you know where to find a digital record of this original, please let me know in the comments below. Speaking of manuscripts, side note, especially for people in organizations that abuse the word scroll, the earlier version of a form of curry is in fact a proper scroll with the leaves sewn together and stored as a roll. Check that out, it's pretty cool. Maybe not so great for looking for recipes, but it's neat. <laughs> okay, now back to our source. The original recipe reads, Take a fair mutton of the butters and cut it in the manner of steakers, and then take a fair roll of parsley and onions shred smaller, yolks of air and sodden hard, and marry your suet. Hew all these smaller together, and then cast there two puder of ginger and saffron, and stir him together with thy honda, and lay him up upon the steakers all abroad, and cast there two salt and roll him together, and put him on the spitter, and roast him till they be enough. So, <laughs> there's your Middle English for the day. Let's head to the very uncharmingly primitive kitchen to which I currently have access, and explore and recreate this dish together. Time to explore our ingredients. First, the mutton. We'll be cutting this into steaks. Mm, powdered ginger. Yes, saffron onions, fresh parsley, <laughs> beef marrow, because I can't get lamb marrow, salt in a beautiful medieval container, black pepper also in a beautiful medieval container, boiled eggs. So, Alois de Mutten calls for onions shred small. Shred is a 15th century English word that doesn't actually mean shred like we understand it. It actually just means to cut small. Interestingly, it is also the 15th century English word for dags, as in the dagging on your hoopalons. They actually frequently, they call them shreds in the text of the period, not dags, at least not that I have found. So there's your little bit of etymology for the day. Okay, well let's cut these onions and shred them small, as it says. Okay, onions are quote unquote shredded. Take fair mutton of the buttus and cut it in the manner of steakis. So let us take in this case, I don't really have access to butt of lamb or mutton, but I do have leg of lamb, which is 
pretty close. So let's go ahead and cut this in two slices that will make good roulade meat rolls, as it were. So I'm going to look and see. I've left it partially frozen so that it will be easier to cut in fine pieces. The recipe doesn't actually say anything about hammering it out, and so I'm actually gonna remain faithful to that idea that it does not say anything about beating it or tenderizing it. And actually with lamb or even mutton, that might be less necessary because it is a uh, more forgiving meat than beef is. So, how to cut you. Okay, I'm gonna do it this way. Nice and thin. Trying to maintain the same thickness all the way through. Now obviously, <laughs> in the Middle Ages, they could not have frozen their meat, even partially to cut it, unless, well, unless it were winter, I suppose, they could have popped it in their larder and possibly things would have frozen or put it outside and things might have frozen partially, but who knows if anyone ever even considered that as a technique. I have certainly never read any medieval set of cooking instructions that called for partially frozen meat for the sake of easy slicing. So this is a modern technique, most assuredly. And I rotate it around, flip it over rather, to get rid of that lip that starts forming. semi-frozen slices of meat to be rolled and spitted. So I was just examining sort of the end piece here and it's got a lot of fat on it and I'm actually going to cut off these bigger chunks of fat, these very solid solid chunks of fat and I am going to render this up into lamb's tallow which I can then use as as they would call it in medieval sources grease <laughs> I could use it to, as a cooking fat, I can use it to make pastry, I can use it to make modernly biscuits, what Americans call biscuits anyway. Cooking, frying, uh, lamb's tallow makes, <laughs> it's going to sound awful, but lamb's tallow actually makes really tasty donuts and other fried pastries, in case you were wondering. So that is what I'm going to do with all this. I'm going to chop up it up really small, render it in boiling water, chill the water after it's all boiled and rendered down and uh, skim off the fat and that will be my lamb's tallow. So bonus on what to do with the leftover bits. After removing all of the extra fat you can see over here, this is going to become my tallow, um, I ended up with a couple of nice actually thick pieces that in, I'm, I am actually going to go ahead and hammer these out into thinner fillets to turn into Roland. So I thought I would show you how I do that in my currently extremely low-tech kitchen. Uh, most of my kitchen equipment isn't here yet, so I'm actually going to just take an empty glass jar and hammer the crap out of this meat, like so. And then following along the path of the improvement of tools, I cast about my kitchen and realized that I have something that might be better actually at hammering this meat out than that glass jar. Yep, definitely better. Recipe also calls for fair raw parsley. So I'm going to go ahead and chop this. Of course you want to remove all of the woody stems they are not great texture-wise. Of 
parsley. So this recipe calls for marrow or suet. I cannot get suet where I'm currently located, but they did have soup bones in the freezer section that actually have some very good marrow bits. So I've let them defrost and I'm just going to use a spoon to scoop out this marrow. Now these are not typical marrow bones. Usually typical marrow bones are the long bones, the femur, they're easier to kind of crack open and get into, but these soup bones, if they're cut right, can actually give you access to quite a bit of marrow, as you see here. And marrow is very flavorful, and it's very fat rich, so I'm confident that that is, the role it plays in this recipe is flavor enhancement. Suet is also basically just a, another kind of fat, so. Here we go. Of course, the recipe doesn't give you any kind of idea of ratio or quantity. It, it never does. So we always have to make guesses and who knows, our guesses may be completely, completely off, utterly unrelated to anything that, any practice of the Middle Ages or even Renaissance for that matter. When finally they start actually providing real quantities and if you've never tasted roasted marrow, you have not lived. I can highly recommend it. Here's our nice little collection of marrow. I think this should be sufficient. Yeah, maybe not. If not, I'll just defrost another bone and scoop it out. All right, onward. Next, hard boiled eggs. We actually just need the yolk. As is typical in many medieval recipes, it's only the yolk that is called for and not the white. However, I think that probably whoever was preparing this dish just ate the hard boiled white as they were cooking along. Why not? Sort of the spoils of the person doing the work. Egg yolks. So as I started really looking at the pieces I managed to slice, some of them had some pretty thick areas. And so I decided to pound some of them out as well. And I also, in using my improvised jar, I decided the pan was not as efficient as I liked and made way too much noise. So I noticed that there's a ring under at the bottom of this jar, which makes it not really good for flattening things out. But on the side, it's very useful for flattening things out. So I'm, I'm going ahead and I'm going to hammer this in the thick parts just to get it to be a little more even and a little more flexible in size. And yes, I was thinking about this. The recipe does not call to tenderize or hammer out the meat. However, a lot of recipes from this era, from the 15th century, assume a good deal of n prior knowledge and almost seem to assume that you basically know the techniques and are familiar with the recipe. And so they're not, these recipes are definitely not America's test kitchen step-by-step -step that would allow anyone to create a finished dish. These are aimed at people who know what is, what is done, they know their way around a kitchen. And so I think there's entirely a possibility that a step like this may have been taken for granted. And they certainly had hammers and mallets in this period for other purposes. There's nothing saying they couldn't have had a mallet for flattening meat. And I, I'm honestly, I'm not certain, thinking about it offhand, I have not, doesn't come to mind at any rate, a recipe that I have found personally that calls for flattening the meat, but I am by no means a dictionary on medieval cookery the way I am a dictionary on medieval dance. So there are way more cooking sources than there are dance sources also, I should emphasize. Far, 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 far more, infinite, I mean just exponentially more. Hence why I've decided to go ahead and pound the meat out in spots where it's not already thin, to make it a little more even, maybe make my fillets a little wider. This was a fairly narrow cut of meat. If I'd actually had access to the cut of the lamb or the beef, if I were doing olives to beef that I wanted, this, these would be wider for certain. But I am in a situation where I have limited resources 
for a lot of things right now. I don't have access to a butcher at the moment where I am. So I have to literally take what I can find. And I expect that a good many of you, dear viewers, are in similar circumstances where you do not have the luxury of a butcher who can get you any cut of meat that you like in any quantity from any kind of animal. And so you might also be left with whatever you manage to find in your local store. And so you may, like I, have to improvise in this case. And so I'm going to let this improvisation stand. No, is this a 100% faithful recreation of the original? Probably not. They probably had an actual cut of meat that would be the butt of the, the sheep versus the leg, which is the upper part of the leg, not the shank. And that's fine. And hopefully someday I will be able to revisit this recipe with those resources. Until then, here we go. The recipe then says, and then take fair raw, excuse me, Middle English, and then take a fair raw parsley, and onions shred smaller, yolks of aaron sod and hard, and merry or suet. Hew all these smaller together. Okay, so basically it says to take parsley and onions chopped small, hard boiled egg yolks, and marrow or suet. And chop this all together small. Now it occurred to me belatedly just now looking in this bowl at the vast amount of onion that we have here. Medieval onions were most assuredly smaller than modern onions because most modern fruits and vegetables are monstrous modern cultivars of their original of their originals. And so I'm going to actually remove some of this onion and I'll, I'll use it somewhere else. I'll saute it up. Maybe I'll put it in the bottom of the roasting pan with the, the, um, with the aloes, the olives, the rolls. But I really am feeling like this is probably proportionately too much onion that an onion, a 15th century onion would not be this big. And that's fine. Yes, I'm losing a little bit of the parsley, but that's okay. I think we will get a better result here. So now I'm actually going to do exactly what the recipe says. And we're going to hew this all small together by chopping it up on the cutting board. Let's go. was chopping and amazed at how these egg yolks do not wish to disintegrate, I had a thought, a, a, a thought occurred to me, a little epiphany. I have a family cookie recipe, a butter cookie recipe, probably that dates to the mid 19th century. It's that old, passed down from generation to generation. And it actually calls for boiled egg yolks and it calls for them to be passed through a sieve to grate, to, to you know, basically pulverize them. And I do know that many medieval recipes call for various things to be passed through a sieve in order to do the same. And so I think going forward, the next time I do this, I will be passing these egg yolks through a sieve. No, the recipe does not call for it in this particular case, but it is a technique from other recipes and I think it would create better results. Again, this takes us back to my comment of not all techniques are necessarily all described in detail in these recipe collections and there is a lot of technique and recipe and ingredient knowledge that is absolutely taken for granted. So next time, hard boiled yolks through sieve. Another thing I should have definitely done uh, was actually mince these onions. The original recipe does say onions red small and so that really does probably mean minced, and I really did not mince them. I chopped them pretty roughly. That probably would have also made this process now easier. 
uh, because I really do think this needs to be quite fine indeed, hence why things in some cases are being cut twice, the onions for instance, because we want to create a sort of smooth paste that we will smear onto our roulades, onto our alois, our steakis as they are called in at the pre-rolled stage in this recipe. We have achieved near paste. So this is pretty, pretty good. I feel like this is potentially where they mean to take this. Uh, if they wanted it finer in this era, I think they probably would have specified ground in a mortar and pestle or some pass with sieve or something like that. But they did not. They said, hew it all together. So I've hewed it all together and now we have a paste that I think will spread quite nicely. Next step, it says, then cast there two powder of ginger and saffron and stir them together with thy Honda. Okay, so I shall put this in a bowl and we shall be adding saffron and powdered ginger. So remember that powdered ginger is a very powerful, powerful spice. Um, so you don't want too much. So this should really be a flavor enhancer. I don't think that this should taste of ginger as it were. Otherwise it might be called aloes de mutton of ginger or something like that. So I'm actually going to try a quarter teaspoon of ginger in this. And then for the saffron, I know if I had my mortar and pestle, I would grind this up, but I don't. So for my saffron, I'm going to, I'm gonna go with a pinch of saffron and I'm just going to lightly mortar and pestle it in my palm of my hand. And I don't want to press too hard and I don't want to apply too much heat because that will actually just start getting all of the flavor compounds all over my hand and not into our dish. And I feel like let's go with a little more than that. So that the saffron is actually a present flavor component. It is very clearly not being used to dye this one yellow because there's none of the usual processes that would allow that to happen, like putting it in an egg yolk or something like that. So I feel this is supposed to be present and not in terms of its taste and not just visually present in its color. Okay. Again, this is working ironically in a modern kitchen yet without the tools I actually need for medieval cooking. So medieval cuisine is actually high tech. It's just a different kind of tech than modern tech. Well, it says, it says to mix this with thy Honda and it does also say, no, we add the salt at the next stage. So we're going to stick to that. We're going to do it with my mine Honda. It certainly feels nice on the fingers. <laughs> sort of like a spa day for the fingers, I suppose. Mm, palm of my hand still smells like saffron. What a great smell. Of course, I know some of you out there do not care for saffron at all. And if you want to make this dish for yourself, then obviously leave out the saffron. It's a flavor giver. It doesn't contribute to the texture of the dish. So there'll be nothing tragic in the structural outcome of your alois. Okay. Let me see how this smells. Mm, smells nice. Nothing's overpowering. I don't, I'm not overpowered by saffron or by ginger. So that's a good thing I feel like. A quarter teaspoon for this little bit. I'm just trying to decide. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a taste. I can taste. A little bit, I'm going to just add another little dash of ginger. This will probably bring it up to like three eighths of a teaspoon. Next, after stirring him together with thy Honda, and lay him up 
people on the stake is all abroad, and cast their two salt, and roll him together, and put him on a spitter, and roast him till they be enough. So, stakes all abroad. So I looked up this word abroad specifically, stakes all abroad, and it literally means to cover the entire thing. So there's no, the recipe is actually being kind of specific a little bit in this case. They don't want you to leave any little edges that free. They want it to be entirely covered. So I'm actually going to use my fingers for this because I'm just getting the idea that maybe that's part of the feature here is using your fingers. And this is definitely smearing quite nicely now that I've chopped it so finely. That was a, an exhausting little bit of knife work. I will say probably the kitchen servant who would be responsible for cutting like that would have a pretty strong, well-developed <laughs> forearm and hand for being able to engage in such tasks over a protracted period of time. Whereas I only <laughs> cut things like that once a day. <laughs> if I am cutting things that finely, in fact. Okay, that looks nice. Okay. All abroad. And then it says, cast there to salt. Be right back, I have to get the salt. Casting there to salt and just a light layer. Don't want too much, just enough to enhance the flavor. I know that most of you watching this probably know this, but salt's primary function is flavor enhancer. It can also tenderize as well. But in this case, I really feel like it's enhancing the flavor. So we have a wider end and we have a narrow end and I'm going to put this narrower end on the inside of the roll. I'm gonna pull a little bit as I roll so that it's nice and tight, but not too much because if you push, pull too much and squeeze too much, then the stuffing starts coming out and we clearly do not want that to happen. Now, the nice thing about meat proteins is that when exposed to heat, they coagulate. So if you have any little tears or whatever, don't worry, they'll, they'll kind of sort of take care of themselves in the process. And uh, here we go, our first little Alois. Isn't it adorable? Okay, onward with the rest. Here are our adorable little Alois de Mutton, our little lamb, leg of lamb Roladen. And now it says to spit them. So now I actually need to go and look for something on which I can spit them because I just realized I don't have my usual equipment here with me. So bear with me as I go hunting for equipment. Okay, well here are our little Alois, our Roulada. And now we're going to spit them. Now, of course, in the in the period in which this recipe uh, was delivered to us, spitting meant spitting and putting them on a rotisserie probably and someone standing there and slowly rotating it around. I don't have a rotisserie. I barely have an oven in my opinion, but uh, kitchen equipment snob here. We're going to spit them anyway. And here's what I know about cooking leg of lamb. Leg of lamb cooks best if you cook it at a slow heat, long, and then at the very end, finish it with a broil to get a nice, uh, you know, that get that Maynard effect going, that nice caramelization. So that's what, that's the approach I'm going to take. If I had a spit boy or a spit girl to sit there and turn a spit that I don't have, <laughs> then that's what we do, but modern kitchen, modern solutions. So let's go ahead and spit these up and uh, pop them in the oven. Metal skewer, 
little tiny adorable Alois and yay, it works. <laughs> One never knows about these things. Now I want to make sure that I try to catch, and I didn't do such a good job on this one, you want to make sure that you catch this tiny little edge flap so that it really seals it. Okay, so you notice how these are all kind of rotating around and that's not super awesome. I really want them to try to stay flat and it occurred to me the best way to accomplish that might be actually to do two spits. So basically a spit on each end. Unfortunately, I've already spit them through the center, I'm trying to decide if I want to just leave it or pull it out and re-spit it that way. Uh, decisions, decisions. Okay, well, let's see what we do. Well, I've decided to respit them. <laughs> Welcome to the world of reconstruction and redaction. Okay, so. Again, I'm going to make sure I try to get that flap. This will be slightly more fussy and complicated than just doing one, but there it is. It's fine. So this is a modern reimagining or interpretation or application of Alois de Mutton. I have a little bit of filling left over. And since I'm not doing this on a rotisserie, the one I don't have and many of you probably don't have either, I'm actually going to put this in the bottom of my roasting pan. And remember all of those onions we talked about earlier, I'm going to put them in the bottom of my roasting pan as well. And I'm going to let the drippings from these alois, alois drip into the pan and impact those. And because this is a low temperature, I don't expect this to burn because I'm, I set the oven to 120, 140 degrees centigrade, about 225 Fahrenheit. And we're going to do it just this batch first and see how it turns out. And then I'll adjust on the second batch. So experimental cooking for the win. Into my deluxe luxury oven. Okay, let's see how it goes. So it's been about 40 minutes, and this is what they look like after 40 minutes. Um, I think if I'd had a whole set of these dripping their drippings onto this, this might have worked a little better. It's, it, the onions would have cooked more because there'd be more fat and juices in there. So now we're going to, I've cranked the oven up. The uh, meat seems to be cooked through. I've cranked the oven up to broil such as it is. And now we're going to put these under to broil to give them a little bit of that Maynard effect. So let's see what happens. So I'm just going to, my environment is so dry <laughs> that I'm worried about these jerking. So I'm actually going to actually put some tallow on them, some beef tallow, because medieval people had a couple of options for cooking oils and one of them they called grease and that could be the rendered fat of a number of things. And I'm fairly confident that beef fat was one of the things they might render. So here, just to try to keep it from drying out under the broiler. Okay, well, let's put that in and let it do its thing. Another five minutes. Okay, well, we've pulled them out. I have to say they look quite nice. Look at these little guys. 
They might be a little on the dry side, so they might be slightly overcooked. We'll tell that once I let them settle. I'm happy with what happened to the onion mixture. That looks actually quite tasty with some lightly burnt bits and some caramelized bits. That will probably taste quite nice. Okay, well, we're going to let these rest and um, then we'll give them a taste and that will help me decide what to do with the next batch. Experiment onward. So I let them set for about 10 minutes, specifically because if you don't know this, you should always let the juices and freshly roasted meat redistribute in the meat before puncturing it in any way, because if you puncture it while it's still sort of excited from the heat, then the juices will just all run out and your meat will be dry. But this also reminded me of something I should have known because I do know it, but we had our little guy and we had our bigger guy and I honestly should have roasted all the little ones together and then the ones of a similar size on up together because this little guy I'm pretty certain is now jerky. <laughs> Whereas this one feels pretty all right. <laughs> so let's go ahead and try our little guy. There's how it looks on the inside. Nope. <laughs> oh well. It's actually tasty. It's not dry on the inside. The outside is slightly jerky like, but flavor is good. I can taste the saffron. Ginger is not really present. It's kind of like a flavor enhancer. Salty enough. Also, I can taste the parsley. So this is pretty good. And in fact, I bet with some of the sauces that are contained in this particular recipe collection, this would be even better. So that's the little one. Let's see about the bigger one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is moisture. Flavors are still good. I still think I should have cooked it for less time. I'll be honest, we forgot to set the timer, so that's on us. But all in all, a very tasty recipe. A little dry on the outside, so I think I'm going to, with the next batch, I'm actually going to experiment with um, broiling just for 10 minutes and see what happens. Yeah, okay, experiment onward. So this is the experiment with just broiling, and I think this might be the winner, but we'll do a taste test. I learned something I forgot to coat both sides in the tallow. So this is the side I coated in the tallow. See how nice that looks. And this jerky looking side is the side I forgot to coat in tallow when I flipped it over. So definitely I think uh, basting them in oil grease is the way to go. And this is possibly another one of those steps that they took for granted because it was just par for the course. It was the job of the spit boy or girl to actually keep basting it with fat. So more lessons learned. So let's go ahead and see how it tastes. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think this is the better way. Just doing it over high heat. It's tender on the inside, the flavor is good, and the side that was <laughs> basted with fat is quite tasty. The side that wasn't is chewy. Okay, well I guess we're going to roast the rest of these, which are much more similar in size. We're going to do this under the broiler with basting. So I shall be painting these in tallow like a renaissance artiste. I did something else this time just out of uh, a sense of preservation for my uh, tiny living abode right now. I put water in the bottom of the, the drippings pan and that actually at this heat, actually I just flipped this, you'll see this actually plumped it up and kept it nice and moist. So now I'm going to spread this side in the tallow and roast that and see what that turns into. Now, granted, this is, I very much doubt that this sort of high temperature steaming combination broiling method is an authentic medieval one. I won't say it is not, but I can say I don't have evidence that it is, but it might produce a nice tasty thing that has a lovely moist texture that might be preferable to you for your own personal dining habits. So let's see what happens. Back into the oven, my pretties. 
Well, here they are. This was the moist side. As you can see, they're still nice and plump and juicy, but they do have that nice grilled Minard effect on top. So I think uh, these might be the winners for a sort of immediate eating. So have you ever made aloes de mutton or aloes de beef or maybe the Italian equivalent bresaiolo or some more modern version of meat rolls? If so, let me know how it turned out for you in the comments below. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and don't forget to always cook creatively. How far have you gotten? Okay, I still have time to eat my food. You have to actually eat the food, not just lick the juice off of it. Food to go and hide?